Tyler Don Rosenquist, and welcome to Character in Context, where I usually teach the historical and ancient sociological context of scripture, with an eye to developing the character of the Messiah, but not right now. Right now I'm doing a series about how to not waste your time with bad study practices, bad resources, and just the general confusion that I faced when I started studying the Bible and was trying to figure out what to do and whose books I should read. Bottom line, I read a lot of nonsense and spent a lot of money doing it. I'm going to give you some basics about how to avoid a lot of pitfalls, save money, maximize your time and effort, and get the most out of what you're doing. A master book list can be found on my website, and it'll be linked to the transcript, and I will add to it as needed. This week, I'm actually adding a book by G.K. Beale on the theology of irony that I was able to pick up on Logos on Black Friday. I will not leave the house to go shopping on that day, but I always check out the book deals, and I will always spend way too much money. This year, it was on the 16-book commentary series that the Irony book was part of. All I can say, guys, is thanks for the donations. And they will have more sales later in December. Last year, I bought the entire Interpretations commentary series, and the year before that, it was the entire NSBT, the New Studies in Biblical Theology series. But I make up for it by dressing in t-shirts and jeans and having no fashion sense or getting my hair and nails done or going out to dinner. Books are like my only real vice. Oh, yeah, and bobbleheads. Today we'll be talking about two of my favorite rhetorical devices in the Bible, polemic and irony. Now, I also love puns, but it's almost impossible to spot them in a translation, so we're just going to skip over that. That's why we have commentaries. <laughs> Polemic is a very ancient way of insulting someone or something through exaggeration and even mischaracterization or through comparison. The obvious places that we find polemic in the Bible are the woes against the Pharisaic doctrine in Matthew 23. And when Paul states that he wishes the circumcision group that was visiting Galatia would just go ahead and castrate themselves and the idle polemics of Isaiah 44 and Jeremiah 10. Polemics, in context, often made a point by creating an outrageous caricature of the thing, person, or group being criticized. The problem with polemics is that if we do not understand them for what they were, which is forced exaggeration, we might take them for an accurate assessment of the thing being ridiculed. This is why, for example, Pharisees have been historically subjected to scorn and vitriol under the mistaken idea that because Yeshua, or you may call him Jesus, was drawing a generalization and following the rules of polemic, although, you know, he did not make the kind of really nasty accusations that were common in the Greco-Roman world, like accusing them of seeing prostitutes are actually having prostitutes and drunkards as members. Now, polemic was used when anyone wanted to say, follow me and not them, or do this and not that, in a really jarring way. People didn't engage in polemic lightly. Okay, well, you know, they did in honor-shame societies, but the biblical version of polemic is excessively tame and restrained compared to what we see in the larger world. So, rule number one of polemic, you cannot take it at face value. The Pharisees weren't really sepulchers filled with dead men's bones, nor were they personally guilty of killing the prophets. Nor did they all wear tzitzit dragging on the floor or, you know, love titles or whatever. This was a public caricature that pointed out the abuses in such a way that it made them all look guilty. But we know that there were humble, godly Pharisees who followed Yeshua. Yeshua was polemically attacking a mindset of excessive legalism that was only doable for those of a certain class and education. And the elitism and exclusivity of table fellowship and hospitality that it led to. Hierarchies of this sort are absolutely opposed to the kingdom way of living. You shouldn't refuse to have someone at your table just because you don't like their doctrine, okay, or how they do things. 
rule number two of polemics. And this one is almost the same as the first. Polemic isn't a historically reliable way to understand ancient idolatry. When we read Jeremiah 10 and specifically Isaiah 44, and this was definitely the case before the surge in archaeological discoveries in the Near East over the last two centuries, we might get entirely the wrong idea about what idolatry looked like and how idols were viewed and what it meant to quote-unquote worship one. But when we understand them as purposefully distorting polytheistic worship in order to, you know, lampoon and mock it, then combine that with studying how the ancients really worshipped and believed, then we can truly appreciate what Isaiah and Jeremiah were trying to communicate. Both texts describe the idol-making process, and yet they make it sound like a hunk of wood overlaid with gold and silver and dressed in purple was actually believed to be a god. Now, of course, we know this isn't true thanks to the texts like the Era Epic, which is so similar to what Jeremiah and Isaiah describe that it's almost scary. The Era Epic describes in detail the manufacture of the idol of Marduk from sacred wood and how the master craftsman shaped it and overlaid it with beaten plates of gold and silver to make the idol appear as though it is pure gold. And this is exactly like the manufacture of the Ark of the Covenant, which was acacia wood covered with beaten gold. In fact, Herodotus thought it actually was made of pure gold, you know, the idol of Marduk, when he wrote about it. However, whereas the Bible makes it sound like the hunk of wood is a god, and that the worshiper believes that, we actually know now that they believed it only held the essence of the god after the performance of the mouth-opening ceremony. And it was through this idol, which was more of a mediator, that the god could be virtually cared for and fed. It was almost like an ancient video game. To the uninitiated, the polemic gives an almost entirely wrong idea of what was going on in the worshipper's mind and in the mind of the idol maker. But none of the original audience were uninitiated. This was their context. Jeremiah and Isaiah were both speaking to people who were guilty of gross idolatry. And they were being confronted with a distorted image of it so their eyes could be opened to how ridiculous it was that a god would even need such an image or that it would be something as base as wood. The polemic was designed to shame them by making what they were relying on look absolutely idiotic. They weren't supposed to get technical and say, well, that's not how an idol works, Jack. They were supposed to consider how ludicrous it was to have a wooden human figure that had to be nailed down and propped up like a scarecrow, as it says in Jeremiah 10, made out of a hunk of wood that wasn't even sacred enough to prevent the craftsman from cooking his lunch over the scraps later. It was just wood. It was just gold and silver. It was just dressed in royal robes. But nothing could really transform it into anything else than the wood it started out as. Other texts are polemical without being obvious. The creation account, the flood account, and the division of the languages at Babel were all texts that were designed to make Yahweh look wise, powerful, caring, and generous while making his Babylonian counterparts, I actually should have put counterparts in quotations because they're not his counterparts. Well, they look just horrid. No, he didn't create the land by destroying another god and throwing down their body as supposedly happened when Marduk defeated Tiamat in Enuma Elish. And the people weren't created from the blood of Tiamat, but from the good soil of the earth, nor were they created to be slaves, but image bearers. The flood wasn't sent upon the earth for the arbitrary reason of the humans being so noisy that the gods couldn't get enough sleep as we see in the Atrahasis epic. It was instead a response to creation being utterly ruined, unredeemable, and chaotic, and in need of a reset. The languages weren't divided as some sort of practical joke by a Sumerian deity either, but for the people's own good. 
Yahweh is shown for who he is and what he is like in how he is portrayed as different from his Babylonian counterparts, who would have looked barbaric in comparison and oftentimes foolish too. It's very subtle and easy to miss if we aren't well-versed in the mythology of Israel's neighbors, but it's unmistakable. The first 11 chapters of Genesis just flat out made the gods of Babylon look like childish jerks. Classic polemic. Worship Yahweh, not these jokers. Unfortunately, polemics taken out of their social context are often used by people as an excuse for truly bad behavior when they lack mature fruit. People think that to be a prophet is to have carte blanche to vent their frustration without restraint, which is why so many vicious people self-identify as prophets. People love to use John the Baptist as an excuse, but let's remember that John wasn't part of the new creation but the old. Or they point out that Yeshua made a whip in the temple and got rowdy, but that's more informed by artistic license than what is actually written. If he had actually gotten out of hand, the soldiers from the fortress Antonia would have scooped him up in a hurry, but would probably have found tables being tipped over and animals being herded off the mount with a quirt to be entirely amusing. We have to understand the function of polemic in that society and cannot just use it to justify the flesh. I always say, you don't get to make a ruckus unless you're willing to be crucified for the people you're ranting about. Now, irony is something entirely different. And so, so much better. I love it. And the only thing ironic about the song, Isn't It Ironic?, is the fact that there is not a shred of irony in any of her examples. Now, irony is a rhetorical device which actually undergirds just about every major story in the Bible. Irony is what you get when you say one thing but mean something entirely different, or do one thing and the opposite is the result. Irony isn't rain on your wedding day. That's just a total bummer. Irony is when your wedding dress is made out of divorce papers, and yes, someone really did that, and I will link the article in the transcript. Irony is eating fruit to become like a wise god and ending up mortal and feeling like an idiot. Irony is selling your brother into slavery only to have him save you from starvation as the vice regent of Egypt. Irony is defeating Satan by allowing his agents to kill you. Irony is the quiet arrival of a suffering Messiah when everyone is expecting the noise and pomp of a military Messiah. Irony is expecting a lion, but getting a lamb. Irony is every single instance of a disgraced, barren woman having a child who brings her more honor than all the sons of her fertile counterparts combined. Irony is Yahweh's consistent favoring of second and youngest sons in a world where the eldest automatically receive the honor and the double portion inheritance. Irony is Yahweh taking something terrible and ugly and fashioning it into something beautiful or taking weakness and showing it as strength, destroying enemies through love and peace, etc. Yahweh works through irony in our lives as well. How often does he completely turn situations around where one day we are as low as we can be and the next we're on top of the world? The Bible uses these ironic images as a rhetorical device to show how entirely different, one, God's priorities are from ours, two, God's ways are from ours, three, how differently we view things than he does, and four, how his kingdom is upside down compared to everything we know from our own earthly experiences. But irony is also why it was so difficult for the majority of the Jewish people in the first century to see Yeshua as the Messiah. Instead of a conquering king, as the world would desire, we got a lamb whose robes were drenched in his own blood. Admit it, it makes no worldly sense whatsoever, and so we very rightly look like demented nutjobs for believing it. Without experientially knowing God, I'd be shaking my head in disbelief 
at believers too. Irony at its heart is something that shouldn't ever go down the way it did. David shouldn't have defeated Goliath. The meek shouldn't inherit anything. Recognizing irony when we see it is very important to truly understanding what the Bible is telling us. When in Isaiah, Yahweh announces that he is doing a new thing, well, that shouldn't shock us. When we are well acquainted with the irony throughout the Bible, we should absolutely and always expect the unexpected. He is always doing a quote-unquote new thing. Really, I would say that we can learn more about Yahweh from the irony in the Bible and also our own personal lives than from just about anything else. I'm going to mention a few categories of irony that we find in Scripture, and I really owe my learning these to G.K. Beale. Actually, I owe so much to him for so many of his books. You know, I could just do a broadcast about that all by itself. I could do many broadcasts about that. Anyway, the book is called Redemptive Reversals and the Ironic Overturning of Human Wisdom, The Ironic Patterns of Biblical Theology, How God Overturns Human Wisdom. And you thought my book titles were excessively wordy. I ain't got nothing on him in more ways than one. So first we have cases where the punishment literally fits the crime, but in an ironic way, which is called retributive irony. We get a lot of this sort of language in the Proverbs and the Psalms, things like evildoers falling into the pits and snares that they set to capture the righteous. I would say that the three most prominent cases I can think of are Haman in the book of Esther, Pharaoh drowning in recompense for drowning the Hebrew babies, and the account of David's crimes and punishment in 2 Samuel 11 and 12. Haman desired to kill all the Jews within the Persian Empire because he was miffed that one wouldn't scrape and bow before him. Tad bit excessive in my estimation. But Mordecai, the Jew who refused to bow, had saved the king's life before the time of Haman's promotion. One night when the king couldn't sleep, he asked for the royal historical records to be read to him, and that would sure put me to sleep. But the king realizes that nothing has been done for Mordecai. Haman walks in. The king asks his advice as to what should be done for someone the king wants to honor, and Haman, humble guy he is, just assumes that it's himself and lets loose with his wildest honor-shame culture fantasies And then, of course, he's forced to personally do all of that for Mordecai. Haman's entire scheme to execute the Jews became his own doom, and he was hung on the very gallows he prepared for Mordecai. The exalted shall be humbled, and the humble shall be exalted. Indeed, you know, Mordecai even gets Haman's newly vacated job. We can also talk about restorative irony or salvational irony. And a lot of these will overlap, but every barren woman in scripture ended up becoming the salvation of the nation through a miraculously born child. Sarah birthed Isaac, which is the beginning of the nation of Israel. Isaac's wife, Rebecca, birthed Jacob, the father of the 12 tribes. Rachel birthed Joseph, who saved not only his people, but also the known world from starvation. The wife of Manoah birthed Samson, who saved the children of Israel from the Philistines. Hannah birthed Samuel, and Elizabeth birthed John the Baptist. From dead wombs came life. If that isn't irony, then I don't know what is. And not only life in the form of a child, but life to the nation and therefore ultimately to the world. A virgin giving birth to one who would save the world is also ironic pretty much the last thing you would expect to happen. The fall of man was due to a man's failure at the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and salvation of man was also by means of a quote-unquote tree. How about the one sinless man who ever lived becoming a curse? That's huge. Destroying your enemy by allowing them to kill you? How about what we're called to do? Forgiving the unrepentant and blessing our enemies and not taking revenge. And that's just the opposite of common sense. 
But this is the upside down kingdom of God where up is down and left is right and tactics that should lead to disaster actually lead to victory. The other gods didn't have to be trusted and couldn't be trusted because they played by the rules of the world. But we have to really trust Yahweh to live a cruciform life. And that's a fancy word that means a cross-shaped life, a life of radical self-sacrifice. We also see a lot of the power through weakness sort of irony. The Beatitudes have everyone who wasn't blessed in the ancient world inheriting and conquering and being praised as the world would never have praised such people. We hear that on our weakness, he is strong. We must become like little children to enter the kingdom of heaven. And no one wanted that because of the ghastly high mortality rate of 72% not making it past their 16th birthday. And children weren't really honored at all or even acknowledged by society. As Paul declared, the foolishness of God is wiser than the wisdom of this world. We conquer not through violence, but through weakness. Mentioning the Beatitudes again and the fruit of the Spirit, I cannot stress enough how absolutely wimpy and womanish those would have come across to men. Men had no need to be peaceable or patient or kind or whatever. You couldn't gain any honor by living that way or protect your family and your interests. And so you get these pushes for believing men to be uber-masculine as the world defines masculinity. And they think it is countercultural, but it really isn't. It's just hearkening back to the pre-political correctness era. But that sort of quote-unquote manliness isn't biblical, but worldly. Great book on that is called Man Enough, How Jesus Redefines Masculinity by Nate Pyle, and that link will be in the transcript as well at theancientbridge.com. Revelation is really big on irony, and we would expect that from an apocalypse. In my favorite example, the Lion of Judah, which is an idiom for the Davidic king, is announced, but no lion shows up. Instead, there's a little slaughtered lamb standing up. And that's a powerful visual. Even more so when we see the kings of the earth hiding from the wrath, not of a lion, but of a lamb. In the Gospel of Mark, we actually see a militant Messiah, but he doesn't go after the Romans. He goes after the residents of the demonic realm where the real battle is taking place. He shows that the real enemies aren't the ones we can see, but the ones behind the scenes using them. Irony is faith building like nothing else. More than that, to serve in an ironic kingdom under the rule of an ironic God absolutely requires faith because we have to live in constant disbelief of what we see around us and we must believe that victory can be snatched from the jaws of certain defeat. Irony tells us that what we can see isn't even half the story. Yeshua said that if we want to save our lives, we will lose our lives. But if we lose our lives for him, we will find life. And if we hear that as unbelievers, all of this really, then it sounds ludicrous. But that is the strength of irony. Positive irony and cynicism don't play well together. And by positive irony, I mean the things that should go badly, but work out in the end for our ultimate victory and sanctification. As Paul tells us in Romans 8.28, we know that all things work together for the good of those who love God, who are called according to his purpose. And that's from the Christian Standard Bible. And it means that bad stuff will happen to us, but that God can and will ironically bring good out of it, even if it takes a long time, even if we don't see it in our lifetime. It doesn't mean that our hardships and tragedies will be removed from us, but they aren't the end of the story. But to have that attitude requires trust, and trust isn't natural to us because we have had plenty of reason not to trust. But through the crazy ironies of this walk, we learn to trust. Without the irony, there would be no need because life would operate entirely according to the rules of cause and effect. It was irony that made Joseph the viceroy of Egypt and made Mordecai the second in command of the Persian Empire. It was irony that Satan's greatest victory was also his downfall. The Bible is filled with impossibilities that are only possible because we worship a God who deals in the ironic. 
And understanding this will change the way you study the Bible forever. (music) 